Hello and welcome. This is a special report on Aadhaar UID project and we are talking to Usha Ramanathan. Usha Ramanathan is a law researcher. She is also an activist and she has been aggressively pursuing every development in the unique ID Aadhaar project. Usha, welcome to the show. Um, first impressions, if I could uh, just have you talk about uh, your first impressions about the Cobra Post revelations. Now, does it even surprise you that the very first stage in the implementation process just turns out to be counterproductive? Um, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about being surprised as much as I'm uh, uh, horrified that after all this period, you know, initially when they started the project and there was no monitoring of the project, when they were not really uh, looking at what's happening in the field and they were making a big deal of it being an outsourced project and therefore, you know, their responsibilities are only going to be with the technology and not with the application of the technology in different places. Uh, I still thought that there would be a time when responsibility would, you know, would come to vest in the UIDAI. I'm actually pretty horrified because, you know, this is a project where they are trying to convert many people's identities into this one identification process that they are setting in place. Even if nominally they are talking about the poor being brought within a system, the kind of responsibility that has to be taken by any agency that is undertaking to uh, help the poor identify themselves to a system uh, should certainly be greater than this. It doesn't surprise me uh, at all, but it do I do wonder, you know, at a project that is based on what they call the weeding out of corruption, uh, spawning various forms of entrepreneurships of corruption uh, is, I mean, it's, it's such a shameful uh, thing to watch. It, I, I mean, I, I oppose the project because there are a, a hundred reasons why I oppose it. But my sense of, uh, my sense of deep disappointment that we could, you know, that the project proponents could uh, allow it to come to such a low pass, I must confess it's an unhappy moment. Where do you think it went wrong? It was once upon a time touted as a very, very ambitious project. What part of it do you think um, even, how did it even get past the proof of concept stage? What went so wrong with the project? Actually, it didn't get past the proof of concept stage in the sense that the project was rolled out even before the proof of concept was done. So this is a project with predetermined objectives. I mean, those are the kind of reasons for which some of us were uh, in opposition to the project. Uh, but if you look from the beginning, the uh, idea of biometrics has been an experiment here throughout sure. this project. It still yeah. continues to be an experiment. Nobody knows if it will work. Whatever evidence has emerged says that it will not work. So the, uh, the intention plainly has not been the actual investing of identities. And that's plain even from the, uh, from, you know, even from the notification, which carefully calls it the creation of a database. So if, you know, if when we say, where has it gone wrong? I think it also depends upon what they see as the objective of it. The objective of this exercise was not authentication and uh, investing of an identity. It was about identification and about, you know, once the number is given, seeding it in every database and uh, re-engineering systems so that it will suit that database. This is a completely different project from, you know, what is spoken about to market the project is very different from what actually is the purpose for which the project has been done. Okay, also there seems to be this whole drama around this project. I have uh, Montek Singh Ahu Aluwalia, for instance, he said, we will simply make it compulsory for those benefiting from government pro programs to register for UID. Nandan Nilakan, he says, Aadhaar is voluntary, but the service providers are going to make it mandatory. The Supreme Court clearly says, no person should suffer for not getting the Aadhaar card in spite of the fact that some authority had issued a circular making it necessary. Now, is there some kind of a turf war? Because what we now see is that Aadhaar is being uh, made mandatory for registration of marriages in Delhi or uh, government employees being ordered to get themselves an Aadhaar card. What is this whole drama about? Is it legal? Is it not legal? Is it mandatory? Give us some legal perspective on this. See, the, the things to remember in this whole process is that uh, the idea of... There are two projects that are going side, side by side. One is the National Population Register, which comes under the Citizenship Act. There is this other project, which is the UIDAI, which, has, which is not governed by any law. If you ask the UIDAI project proponents, they will constantly tell you, no, no, we have the uh, executive order, the notification that sets us up, and that is enough law for us. But actually, a law has to say what is the limits of right. exercise of power by any agency, 
what kind of responsibilities do they have, what liabilities do they have in the event that they fail. There are a range of things that need to be done, none of which exists in that notification. There were that, that notifica and you know, there are no protections to citizens, there are no protections to people whose, you know, whose uh, data is being taken over. The idea of ownership of database, that is your data and mine, will sit in somebody's database which will be owned by them for them to make profits out of that data. Now these are all the ambitions that are imminent in that project. They are not the ambitions that are being communicated to us. The National Population Register, it comes with its own set of problems. It's not like it's a, oh, it's the great panacea and that's where we should have gone. It comes with the whole set of problems. But it is still governed by statute. You have something to challenge when you want to challenge the National Population Register. You have nothing to challenge when you don't even know who to challenge. Right. You don't even know if the UIDA is the government, it's not the government. Who is this holding our database? We have absolutely no information. So when you say turf war, the turf war that occurred actually happened between the National Population Register and the UIDAI. The third turf, which is all of us, has of course got completely, we've become, you know, like objects in this exercise and subjects of the state. So I don't think we're even included in the turf. But these two, these two agencies, in the beginning, the national, the UIDAI was not meant to be collecting data on its own. It is the ambitions of Mr. Nilakani, who then spoke to the Prime Minister. So if you look at it, the, the three people who've been pushing for this project have been Mr. Nilakani, with the active support of the Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, and Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. So this, is, this has been the team that has been, you know, pushing for it. I think uh, the uh, National Population Register, which is linked up with the determination of citizenship, has a process where it is proactive in the sense that it has to make some effort to find out who the people are. Sure. There is that amount of responsibility on it. Secondly, that can be used only for the purposes of investing or determining citizenship and for nothing else. The kind of data that is gathered also does not permit any other kind of determination about a person. It doesn't say whether you're rich or poor or you've got, you know, whether you, you know, what your sexual orientation is or whatever. None of that is the concern of that register. So to the UIDA, they have a minute, but by the national population register will not seed itself into databases. It, it's a governmental project to find out how many people we have, who are these people, and to create a citizenship register, citizens register, which, like I said, does come with its own set of problems. The UIDAI doesn't tell you what its objective is. So you have the UIDAI sitting somewhere and saying, I want to create a quick database. I want everyone to be databased as fast as possible. What do I do to market the idea? First of all, you start with saying that this is nothing, it's just a simple identity. You don't tell people that this is not an identity because you can't use it yourself. You need somebody who is an authorized user agency, which means a bank or whoever has an agreement with the UIDAI, who will then use this process to identify you. Nobody even knows that. They think it's an identity they're walking around with. It has no validity as an identity. It has some use as an identification process by some other agency. Even that, you know, we really don't know at all. So there has been a lot of deliberate non-information and then deliberate misinformation which has led people into wondering what this is about, not knowing and then being through this mandatory process. Why did they need to make it mandatory? Where did they make it mandatory? They made it mandatory in places where it will willy-nilly force whole sections of the population to enter the database. And if you look at this project, you can enter the database but you can't exit it. There is no opt-out provision in this. So you may need it for any one little something somewhere because they make it mandatory, but you're on the database. As far as they are concerned, the database is taken care of. one more time. You said there's no exit process. So um, so you go enroll. Uh -huh. You get on. They, they get your information about you. They issue you a number. You can't number say all right. But you can't say, I want my data to be removed from the database. Ah. So number stays They own you. the database. But the data is also corruptible. No, that's the alternative school. No, no, that's a completely different thing. So the point, which is why I'm saying, that this process, see there are two trajectories in this. One trajectory is where they say you go enroll. There is supposedly a deduplication process which is invisible to all of us, uh, but which is supposed to be happening. And then you have the generation of a number and there is authentication, which means that you, you know, when you go somewhere, you put your fingerprint your, or your iris and you get authenticated. Now for that to happen, biometrics have to work. Now actually when they started the process, when they had started enrollment, they, you know, the year that they started the enrollment, that, uh, Jan that January, February, for the first time, having decided that they were going to use fingerprints and uh, iris 
as the biometrics which would be used for enrolling people. Right. After that, they started with admitting to a consultant who they invited. That, in the sense, it was an open invitation to a consultant where they said that we have no information on whether biometrics will work in this country. In fact, it's established that it doesn't have 100% accuracy. See, 100% accuracy, nothing has. So I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. But what if it's something that changes frequently? For instance, on many, you know, March after they had started, in 2012, September, they did an iris authentication report to see whether you can or cannot authenticate. This is three years, three years after they've begun. Huh? They do an iris authentication. So there was no, it wasn't a question of doing small sample studies from where you figure out what kind of things will happen with the population. Can we use it for authentication? Is, can it work long term? None of that got tested. So you start that, or iris authentication report starts with this amazing statement, which is like straight out of either fantasy land or gaga land. It starts with saying that the iris never changes. Neither weather weathers it, <laughs> nor age withers it. Now, I mean, I, this, I mean, this is not how they said it. They said sure. it in a much more prosaic manner. Then, you know, some of us got curious about this. Is there any part of the body that doesn't age at all? And then when we did a little ferreting around, we found that the presumption had been made because no longitudinal studies had been done on this. So nobody really knew. And so long as you don't know, you can say, you know, you can make any pr assumptions that you want. This was an assumption. And actually, the first time that this was studied and tested, uh, and this was in Notre Dame University, by a person who swears by biometric and who, uh, in an interview, had said that, uh, you know, if he had to choose an alternative line, where would he rather be? He said, I would like to be head of the UIDAI. Oh, I see. So, he, you know, it's that kind of aspiration. So a person of that bent of mind had found that uh, iris template wears out, I mean its confidence level drops between one and a half to three years in, in that period of time. So, you know, this is an experiment on a whole population, we've been saying that forever, but, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just something that they've decided that they want to do. The NPR is now, get, has got, you know, when you talk about turf war, there is NPR, there is UID, AI. In 2012 January, the Home Minister at that time early in January said that this data that is being created uh, through the UIDAI is insecure data and they can't accept it. Because they said, you know, you're using an introducer system which has no validity at all. Anybody can introduce someone. And it's interesting, the way the UIDAI has thought about the introducer, introducer is for people who don't have a document that is acceptable to the enroller or to the registrar. So they say, okay, what are you going to have? in its place. If you don't have a document, how do you get people enrolled onto the system? Because they just want to database everybody. Right. Everyone has to get onto the database. So they said, we'll, int we'll create this character called the introducer, except that the introducer may not know the person who they have to introduce, because many, uh, ma you know, many people among the poor are not known by name, by their father's name, mother's name, address, age, to those who may act as introducers. So they said, it's okay, so long as you're approved by a registrar, you introduce anybody you want. So basically you take the responsibility of everything. There is no responsibility, there is no liability anywhere. How does it matter? We just want to create the database. Who says we need accuracy in the database? We need ubiquity, which means that, you know, we need universality, which means everyone should be on the database. We will generate a number for everybody. We need ubiquity. We'll make you seed this number in every database that we can so that we can profile you. We won't use it for malevolent purposes. We just want to know whether it's worth selling stuff to you or not. If somebody else uses it for other purposes, that's not our problem. So it's a highly irresponsible, market-centric, narrow uh, vision of what people think that they have the right to do with a population. In the, uh, just to complete that, so when Mr. Mr. Chidambaram, who was the Home Minister at that time, raised the question about, uh, you know, about the insecurity of data, then they you know, they, they, there was a tussle. So you, if you read the papers during that time, you'll find that Mr. Nilakani was very upset. He was saying, how, how can you stop us and question? So, and he needed the mandate to be expanded for him, you know, from 20 crore to further. And for about 20 days, there was a standoff between them. And then there was this really moving and touching scene on television where you had uh, Montek Singh Aluwalia at the center and Mr. Chidambaram on one side of him and Mr. Nilakani on the other. And they shook hands and made up. And they said, uh, from now on, we'll share the country 50-50. So you take 50% of the country, the territory, you take 50%. So this turf, which is all of us, got divided equally between these two. So what happened to security of data? What was this game about?
So there is really no legal cover to this whole thing? There Absolutely is no cash, not. There, there is, is no, no legal cover to the UIDAI. And the NPR, by linking itself up in this way with the UIDAI, where they are actually handing over data to be owned by the UIDAI, who incidentally we don't know who they are. Right, and uh, that's another thing I was going it's to It's illegal. Um, the fact that they're actually making it mandatory, for instance, like I said, the, uh, the marriages in Delhi, they are made, Aadhaar is mandatory to get marriages registered in Delhi. Now, it seems to be a giant leap towards... Uh, an authoritarian control by data mining companies. I mean, in economic parlance, you call it a demand um, a demand side push projected as a supply side uh, pull. Now, why, uh, do you think we're running the risk of becoming a database state only uh, only handed over through uninformed consent? Yeah, let me let me say this that you know the the thing about technology and technology companies has been that it has been able to pretend for a very long time that it is neutral that technology is neutral i think it's a myth that has been very carefully built up and it's time we broke this myth technology you know the, those who are the proponents and marketers of technology are actually actually uh, from from who i have seen are not very uh, you know their idea of politics is very narrow you know, it's it's about power. Sure. But actually, politics is not just about power. Politics is what you know. Each of us is a political being in a, in hundreds of ways. The idea of technology as being what it will be, uh, as it will be determined by those who control that technology, is something that has been deliberately kept out of public consciousness. So, who sits behind that data and does what they want with it is not visible for us to see. And actually, like I've been saying, you know, there, there's one analogy that works very well. And when you look at the UID uh, project, you'll find that it works perfectly. This is about the birth of a new religion. What is this new faith? You know, there is this something that is omnipotent, that can see everything, that knows everything, that can watch everyone everywhere. And it, you know, it doesn't do wrong. You do wrong, it will watch you. You have to have faith in it. It doesn't make mistakes. There can be a little, you know, things will go wrong here and there. Just to tell you that that you know, that that being is there. So it's very close to, an, to the birth of a new faith. And that's what they're asking us to do. They're saying you don't ask questions when you have faith. They want you to have faith in technology. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, there are many of us who are watching those who control this technology and know that, you know, that there are various ways. I mean, I'm not saying that all those who are uh, interested in this technology are doing it for malevolent purposes. Sure. But it's a question of, you know, who determines what is malevolent. I mean, there is, for instance, this whole uh, ambition to do, to treat data as the new property. Technology permits that. The potential of data as the new property. So it's a very significant kind of thing. But the second thing is that uh, there is a distance that is deliberately being created between the state and the people. If you look at something like the Electronic Services Delivery Bill, on the one hand, it might speak of efficiency, but, you know, nobody wants to debate what will happen when people can't actually see the state or the state doesn't see the people, but you only can, you know, you, you talk to each other through this, you know, through this medium of technology. So technology is substituting for too many things and it is giving more and more control into those who control technology. There are many of us who don't want to be so controlled. In this kind of a context, freedom has no meaning. Sure. I started off by asking you what went so wrong with this. Now, if we were to go back to the drawing board, and actually indeed realize that the current number of IDs that we have are really not enough and we need one more unique identifier. What would we do differently? See, there is one thing that about the UID project which is very important. Just like I said that there is the difference between identity and identification. If you hear Mr. Nilakani, he has been consistently saying that this is not about an identity, it's about creating an identity platform, which means that Private, and this is said, I'm not including the word private. Private has been there from the beginning. Private and governmental agencies can use this pr uh, identity platform in dealing with whatever they want to deal with. I think the first thing that, I mean, uh, the, the problem with this is that it guarantees a person nothing. It doesn't even gar guarantee them the ability to assert their identity. Right? So, if actually an identity had to be created then it should first of all be an identity secondly it should be an identity i mean you were talking about a unique identifier i'm not so sure 
in what we want it to be unique. Sure. Should it be unique in uh, in saying that I'm malnourished, I'm not, I'm saying whoever is, or should it be unique in making the distinction between people who are uh, uh, entitled to certain protections from the state? Should it, what kind of uniqueness do you want? Or do you want somebody else to be able to pick us off as each individual uniquely? I actually think that in, a, in any state other than a totalitarian state, and I'm hoping that nobody wants us to be running you know, towards becoming a totalitarian state, in any such place, any kind of identification, any kind of identity investiture that happens has to happen so that it strengthens the power of the individual over systems. Systems are, you know, the, the whole idea, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, and I mean, I'm a, not a practicing lawyer, but a legal sure. person. And the first thing that we learned was that the Constitution is about the limits of the power of the state, not about the power of the state. Right. Any structure like that, any system like this that gets created has to respect that basic norm. A very angry Usha Ramanathan over there. On that note, it's a wrap on this particular edition of uh, uh, the special report on UID. Thank you, Usha, for joining us. Okay, if I can convert that anger to earnest. Okay, yeah. then, there you go. A very okay. earnest Usha Ramanathan over there. Uh, we will continue to bring you more updates on the UID process. We are tracking the developments very, very closely. Watch this space.